Welcome to part three. In contrast to the previous segment, this part of the review will be much shorter, because of the fact that there is much less to say. The player's handbook contains the majority of 5th edition's mechanics, whereas the monster manual is significantly less. Most of it is just the stat blocks for a collection of monsters one might encounter in an adventure, which is why I won't be going chapter by chapter like I usually do. But just because I have comparatively less to say doesn't mean I have anything to say at all about it. So let's begin. The opening section describes what monsters are and the environments they can be found in, giving a few examples of regions that might be infested with said monsters and which ones to use. Following that, we get a series of crawls on the gist of a monster's main stats. Size, armor class, hit points, etc. Some of these entries show a baseline of what it should be according to size and challenge rating, but we won't get any real creation material until the DM's guide. Sadly, the concept of minions is gone from this edition, which limits any set-piece-like approach a DM might want to make. It's at this time I should note the return of challenge ratings, which contain much of the same problems as they did in previous versions that had appeared. To summarize this definition, challenge ratings, or CR, is a rough level estimation of what would be a moderately difficult encounter for a party, usually calculated by the average of the party's levels. I don't want to go into too much detail on it, but a lot of the problem lies in the fact that CR has assumptions that undermine its usefulness if deviated from. It assumes the party is composed of the basic four classes and are properly optimized, and further assumes that none of the optional rules are being used. Basically, challenge rating only works when you take the simplest route possible mechanically, and you can't assume everyone is going to do that. On a more positive note, 5th edition introduces the concept of legendary creatures and their subsequent actions. Said creatures are supposed to be boss-like variants of their normal blocks, but with a new set of actions used as a resource that can be activated at the end of another creature's turn. Some of these actions may be based on its environment. The remainder of this book is the stats of various monsters in alphabetical order, with only a handful having a real subtype. I'm not going to critique every single monster block in here because that would take all day, but I do have a few observations I wish to make on the monster design as a whole. First, the return of save or die. I don't like the concept of one bad die roll killing the character completely, or in lesser cases severely incapacitating them unless they're cured by a specific spell. It comes off as a low rent shock value that hack writers are lambasted for when it's used in fiction. Adding to the issue is that avoiding these effects with certain monsters comes very close to metagaming. A popular example I can think of is the Medusa. As I said in the last video, much of the action economy has been gutted in favor of a more ad hoc approach. As a result, a lot of the tactical options for a monster have been gutted as well, unless they're very high level. Worse so, you have a majority of the monsters in a one-size-fits-all mentality, where there's little in the way of variance. It's like it's trying desperately to be like the monstrous manuals in AD&D. And as a final note on this, I'm not fond of the removal of the encounter group examples that were present in 4th edition, nor the removal of minion rules or the pseudo-classes that monsters had. There seems to be more emphasis on fluff here, which is significantly stronger with some monsters, but lacking with others. Also, it's operating under the assumption that there's this default setting that is and isn't touched on throughout the books. Getting an additional attack is something that is portrayed as not easy undertakings for player characters, either getting it at a high level or needing to expend a resource to have it. On the other side of it, the majority of the monsters in this book have some form of multi-attack per turn, many having three or four attacks at a time, while the PC at the same level may have only two at most. Psionics is hinted at in the introduction of the book, and a few creatures have a psionics effect, but all that it really means is said monster can cast certain spells without preparation. Trouble is, these are spells from the same spell list that the PC have, as if all magic is the same. As a system matters guy, I'm not fond of this, and I'll get into why when we get to the DM's guide. Moving past that, the monsters are organized from A to Z, with an appendix for more mundane creatures and another for NPC stats. While there is some sense of customization in templates, I think the template stuff should have been its own appendix in and of itself. Furthermore, without a proper formula of abilities, there's little one can do to vary the monsters from their initial stats, while still keeping them balanced. It amounts to an adversarial approach to complexity that has been underlying throughout this book and the previous one, and will continue to be so as we go on. In Part 4, we finish out our look at D&D 5th Edition with the Dungeon Master's Guide, as well as my final thoughts on the game as a whole. 